Hi, my name is Barry Palsman, and this is a talk called Virtuous Reality. This is a story all about how emerging technologies and immersive storytelling platforms, such as virtual reality and even augmented reality, can be used for good. These days, I know everyone's talking about getting stuck in the metaverse, um, but I really think this quote from Jaron Lanier is pretty apt for the work I've been doing um, in VR and AR over the past few years. The most important thing about technology is how it changes people. I just love that. And I think it couldn't be more true. My first exposure to VR was while I was working with the UN, I had an opportunity to go to a Syrian refugee camp and uh, film a day in the life of a young girl, a young girl named Sidra. And that film became known as Clouds Over Sidra. Um, a pretty incredible thing happened after we made the film. Um, first, this was the first of its kind. No one had ever created a 360 um, documentary, live action documentary like that before. And really no one was thinking of VR as a way to communicate these uh, social impact issues. Um, but the Secretariat's office at the UN, uh, the office of the Secretary General, uh, they um, found out about this film and they had an event coming up. Uh, the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, the, the previous Secretary General, he hosts an annual uh, fundraiser, donor event uh, for the Syrian refugee crisis uh, to raise funds from individual donors. And at the last minute, they were able to bring this this film, this VR experience to the event. And um, people that were there were able to really step into the lives and into the life of this young girl and, um, and, and better immerse themselves um, and better understand, you know, what the lives of refugees uh, are like. And at these donor conference, they typically have uh, an estimated amount of donations they're expecting. Um, they were expecting about $2.3 billion to be raised in 24 hours. And after adding VR, uh, after adding this particular VR experience at the last minute, um, uh, the event ended up raising $3.8 billion instead. So an extra billion and a half dollars just in 24 hours uh, from one seven minute long VR experience. Um, and that's when, you know, it really struck me. This is such a powerful tool for social change. Um, and that's just one of the ways that um, some of this UN VR work that I've gotten to work on uh, has really made an impact. Another way is through helping decision makers um, better understand what they're uh, making decisions about. We had an opportunity after Clouds Over Cedra to go and film in Gaza. Uh, and I spent some time with the family there and, um, and really captured what it was like just to be a mom a mom with two kids living a life in Gaza. Um, you know, it's not sensational. There's no bad guy in the story. It's just a story about humans. Um, and, uh, and one of the coolest things about this project was um, not only did we get to uh, screen this film for the UN Security Council, which you can see here, um, on a day when they're deliberating, on uh, new policies for the livelihoods of the Palestinian people. Um, but in addition to that, we also premiered the film in Tel Aviv. Um, the film is really unique in that it gets to, it exposes uh, a side of, um, a side of the story that is often undocumented, underheard, um, and underrepresented in the media landscape. And so, allowing people in Israel to just go behind that wall, get into someone's life, get into someone's house, better understand where they're coming from. Um, you know, we saw people crying in the streets of Tel Aviv watching this film. And I think in a lot of ways, um, that is um, just a testament to the magic that immersive media can bring to, uh, to issues that matter. Um, another sort of extension of this project actually was through the UN. We were able to get all of the films that we had been creating, uh, five or six different VR films, into a VR app, uh, created a, a mobile app, 
and um, we're able to work with universities around the world to uh, develop curriculum uh, to go along with the films and that way uh, the films are currently uh, screening in over 40 countries right now um, the films have been translated into 15 languages um, and we are just really excited to see the continued impact of you know just a handful of small films um, you know done in this immersive way are able to really move the needle um, for so many people and um, I have a little behind the scenes video I wanted to show just to give a sense of what some of the filming is like when we go uh, on the ground and do these documentaries. Now, we know immersive stories can lead to real world behavior change. And um, I think there's something really interesting going on in how we measure that behavior change. Um, often the easiest and most common way we see the measurement happen is through surveys where people say, oh, I'll be different tomorrow because of this thing I experienced today. Um, you know, as hopeful as that is, um, it would be great to get a little more accurate and clearer picture uh, of the actual behavior change people go through uh, after immersive experiences. And one of the most interesting places doing that right now is at a Stanford University, they have the Virtual Human Interaction Lab. And at that lab, um, they have all sorts of uh, experiments where they have um, people come through and, you know, let's say they'll, ha you know, a third of them will read an article um, you know, read an article about deforestation in this example, and, and a third of them will uh, watch a web video, just a sort of standard uh, flat video about deforestation, and a third of the group will actually don a VR headset and will their, their avatar is going to hold the chainsaw and they chainsaw down some trees uh, in VR. And at the end, um, all three groups, you know, they'll go and speak with a person that's doing the survey uh, individually. And um, every time the way that they do their surveys, every time um, the participant sits down, uh, there's always a glass of water uh, and a small stack of napkins next to the glass of water. And at uh, some point during the questionnaire, uh, the administrator of the survey will accidentally knock over the glass of water and the people that have read the article about deforestation and the people that watch the flat film about deforestation they take six to eight napkins to clean up the water um, and the people that went through the vr simulator and chopped down trees with a chainsaw um, on average they pull off one to two napkins to clean them up clean up the same amount of water um, now that is a pretty marked difference in behavior um, and it's just a really cool way to uncover, you know, where people stand to uncover, are they going to make a different decision under pressure? Um, and it, 
seemingly disconnected way. You know, nothing about um, that VR experience where they're chopping down the tree says that you shouldn't use more paper towels. You, you know, we should use less napkins. None of that. Um, it's just something that uh, people have implied and made the connection for. So I think it's just a really cool way to think about like ways we can measure the impact of VR. It's, and and um, I love the idea that we can have these kind of physical games um, to see if people are, are uh, more primed uh, for empathy. Um, one of the other projects I got to work on uh, after we made these UN VR experiences, which are really just linear films, they're 360, but they're, you know, it's a linear film, just like a regular film in a lot of ways. Um, I had an opportunity to work with the American Association of University Women and led a small team uh, to develop a, um, a salary negotiation simulator specifically designed for women to help women better negotiate their salaries in VR. So you have a conversation with your HR manager. Um, they walk you through some tips and tricks. You have an opportunity to practice what you're going to say to your manager with your HR person. Um, and then eventually your, your manager comes in and you can um, take different tacks, try different things and see uh, if you're able to negotiate your salary uh, to the best uh, number it can be. And that really was just another watershed moment for me where I realized, okay, you know, okay, immersion works, interactivity, people making choices inside of their immersive experiences even works better. You know, how do we continue this trick of immersion? How do we make people feel like they really are there? They're really making these choices under pressure. Um, and I guess just lastly, I wanted to end with a project um, that continues to search for um, ways to communicate big, important social impact issues on brand new emerging canvases, right? All of a sudden, AR is here. We are about to have AR glasses everywhere. Um, a few years ago, Magic Leap came out and uh, rolled out their AR glasses. And this is a project that I got a chance to produce that's all about um, the homelessness and eviction crisis in the U.S. Um, we uh, built this, designed and built this large cube and you wear a magic leap and you walk around it by putting your hands up in the air and seeing the stories kind of come out of the walls. Um, and that is just another opportunity again for people to further the trick of the immersion, to have a physical memory, to navigate through stories physically uh, and not just be a passive participant, not just be um, an audience of our traditional media, which is usually a one-way street, but to really be an active participant. My goal, and I hope I've made the case today, is to inspire you all to realize that we can tell stories that matter on new spaces, on spaces we thought were only for games and only for entertainment. These spaces can contain stories that matter. They can move people, they can move the world forward, and they can move the needle. Thank you.